I just wanted to welcome you back uh, for another evening of the great conversation. Before we begin, I uh, just briefly also wanted to invite you to our annual lecture, which will also uh, be online this year on the subject of atomic doctors, conscience and complicity in the nuclear age. It fits right into our theme for the year about the uses and abuses of technology in uh, modernity. So uh, Professor James Nolan, uh, there's the link. I think James just shared it. Uh, please use it to sign up if you're interested. It's during lunchtime next Thursday. So grab a, grab a sandwich and join us if you can make it. Thank you very much. David, take it away. Thank you so much, Danilo. It's great to see you all. And more people are arriving as we speak. Um, so I want to... Uh, temporize just a little bit to give a couple more people a chance to get on. But uh, I hope that you all found this as exciting as I always find Shakespeare. And um, so I hope that this will be as, as pleasurable a session as, as, we, uh, as we can have, in fact, because it, there's, there's much delight to be had with Shakespeare. All right, so I think I will begin the formal uh, opening here. There's not a lot to say about Shakespeare's life. Um, you might expect with a writer who's had um, perhaps more effect on uh, the subjectivity of humanity uh, than, than perhaps anybody else uh, would, would, would have more um, biography for us to grab onto. But as uh, Harold Bloom, a great literary critic says, the, the one writer who truly seems to have become himself only by representing other selves uh, Shakespeare, because he put himself and found himself in his plays, especially, uh, one might not be surprised if one thinks about that, that his life might be more to be found in the collected works than in a um, recounting of the details of his life. But we should have some of those details in mind. So he was um, born in 1564 and he died in 1616. He was uh, from a, a modest family. Uh, his father was a glover, and his mother came from a Catholic family. So there's, there's in the Catholic world, a lot of talk about the recusant possible, um, uh, possible recusant uh, connections, the uh, crypto-Catholic um, possibilities with Shakespeare. Uh, he, they, the family lived in a prosperous market town in the English Midlands uh, in a town called Stratford-upon-Avon. Uh, there, the grammar school would have given William a very solid education in uh, oratory rhetoric and classical literature. This is a lands an educational landscape that has been shaped by the humanist revolution that we've already um, talked much about in the last few weeks. At 18, he married the 26-year-old uh, Anne Hathaway, not the actress. Um, they had a daughter, Susanna, uh, six months after their wedding. And then uh, not two years later, they had twins, Judith and Hamnet. And that name obviously has significance. Um, Hamnet died at 11. So Shakespeare has these two daughters, Susanna and Judith. And that's very important because in the late plays of which uh, The Tempest is one, the father-daughter relationship is, is crucial. Uh, sometime after losing Hamnet, he would have gone to London and become a multi uh, uh, begun a multi pronged career as an actor, a player, but also as of course a playwright and also as a businessman, as as um, a manager of, of the theater company, which uh, was the Lord Chamberlain's Men until Queen Elizabeth died and King James took over in 1603, and then the company became known as the King's Men. Uh, of course, his theater in London was called the Globe. And that's, uh, that indicates already the, the kind of scope of uh, dramatic art in the uh, Renaissance, the, the notion that, and this is pervasive in Shakespeare and we see it here in this play, um, the notion that our lives are, uh, are a play. And the, the theologian uh, Hans-Wurz von Balthasar talks about a theodrama. Uh, Shakespeare is not 
overly religious in his plays. In fact, that's one question about the Tempest is why uh, it's it's really not explicitly Christian at all, and that's 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 a enigma for us to to think about. But he he wasn't very partisan about anything. He he was human. He covered the whole. Um, he wanted to encompass all of human experience, and because he was so. Uh, we can say here, little c Catholic, so open to the whole. He get, he was able to change um, our very experience of um, ourselves, our our own interiority, what it means to be a person with feelings. Uh, he's essential in that story, and it's not just in the West. Um, in in so far as the Western technological project has taken over the world. The Shakespearean project of, of human personality has also done so. Um, we'll want to think about these claims because, of course, consumerism has a way of flattening interiority. So that that's a question. And, and Shakespeare's not as read the way he used to be. But as the Commonwealth Shakespeare Company, who does the uh, free um, plays on the common here uh, every summer, except this summer, um, and they were going to do The Tempest. So that'll be next year. Um, they, they talk about how two books went west with our pioneers. The sh everybody had a Bible and had a copy of Shakespeare's collected works. And um, that, that's important to keep in mind. Shakespeare shaped the early modern English language and therefore just English as we know it uh, more profoundly than any other author. Um, he wrote around 39 plays, we don't have all of them, uh, 154 sonnets, uh, various other poetry. And uh, he had a great uh, influence in all of these genres. When Harold Bloom talks about um, the invention of the human as, as one of, uh, as, as what Shakespeare has done in his work, that might seem hyperbolic, but he's not the only one who talks this way, uh, that is, it's a claim that Shakespeare is the greatest writer who has ever written. And I, I, I think that is very plausible as, as a claim. Jacques Barzun in his uh, history of um, modernity says, making character a category of thought yielded nothing less than a rival to the physiology of the humors, namely psychology. The cognate fact is that in the drama before Shakespeare, there are no characters, only types. Literature presented great figures made distinct from one another by a well-marked trait or two, but not rendered unique by complexity. And th that could be a uh, controversial claim, but if you think about the experience of reading um, Homer and the experience of reading a modern novel, the claim here by both um, Bloom and Barzun is that the shift, the, the um, the difference in psychological feel from the pre-modern to the modern has everything to do with Shakespeare. And that I think is a defensible proposition. There's a claim that we have are shown more of human interiority, its passions, its scope in Shakespeare than anyone else. And conversely, that we therefore reading Shakespeare, seeing Shakespeare performed, um, access our own interiorities differently. Uh, if we want to speak of a Western subjectivity, the individual, to speak of personality in the absolute way moderns uh, speak of it, this new thing, uh, Shakespeare is the one that one could point to um, most readily. There's the claim that Bloom makes that no one before since Shakespeare made so many separate selves. So there's the sheer number of characters. I might want to point out that Dante, of course, involves a huge number of characters in his own commedia, but there is a difference. I mean, I think Dante's part of the story, an essential part of the story, but if you think even about the, the Divine Comedy and those subtle portraits we do get, is there not a difference? Is there not something that Shakespeare is, in fact, um, moving along? After King James uh, ascended the throne in 1603, by our best uh, guesses, because we, we don't have a lot of sure knowledge about where the, when the play, the chronology of the plays. But it seems that after that accession, uh, there was an immense uh, 
creative verse from Shakespeare that in 16, so from 1604 to 1607 or so, Othello, measure for measure, all's well that ends well, Lear, Macbeth, Antony and Cleopatra all seem to have come from this period of, of three years, a, a remarkable um, production. But then in those, the last years of his um, playwriting career, at least as a solo author. So he did write After the Tempest with John Fletcher, a couple of other plays, including Henry VIII. But The Tempest is the last of his solo authored plays. And it seems to have been um, produced in 1611. In fact, before King James at Whitehall. And again, the next year in the nuptial celebrations for his daughter, Princess Elizabeth, who was, um, affiance to the elector palatinate uh, Frederick. In the last year, 1608 to 1611, the last plays of Shakespeare are all what a later critic uh, and, and most critics have taken the term up, uh, termed romances, the Pericles, Cymbeline, The Winter's Tale, and The Tempest. And here Though we see themes that are through, present throughout um, Shakespeare's career, we do feel a different mood. And trying to understand what is different is, is important in understanding what Shakespeare has been about all along. Part of the point of this, this conversation, this lecture and this conversation is, is to hopefully uh, reignite if, if, if the flame of um, pleasure that you take in Shakespeare had, uh, was never lit or has died out, I, I would hope to foster a recognition of that because it is uh, difficult to find an author who gives as much pleasure as this author does. And to understand, to there are difficulties in reading Shakespeare. As with Dante, um, one is used to reading um, uh, with a lot of notes. And with Shakespeare, you've got a lot of um, uh, footnotes about the language. Here in this presentation in our uh, volume, we don't include those notes. And I think The Tempest was a good one to start as far as reading a, a clean text. One should stop every once in a while to read a word that, that you don't get the hang of as in context. But generally, he still makes sense, even though this is a language um, 400 years separated from us. And I would want no one to be scared off of the pleasures of Shakespeare because of um, difficulties of language. It, it's worthwhile just to, to let the, the language do its magic and to let the characterization and the drama um, take one in. And one is carried along and one surrenders to um, an experience that doesn't require us to nail everything down either semantically or in terms of whatever we want to say the meaning of the play is. So I don't want to say that this is what Shakespeare is saying about X in The Tempest or in his work, but there is something going forward in his work, especially in these last plays, clearly about forgiveness and reconciliation, which come to the fore as the great preoccupations of his work. And that I think is, is the, um, the thing that gives us a, a great entree into understanding what is going on in these plays. The Tempest is the second shortest uh, of the plays that Shakespeare wrote, the shortest being the Comedy of Errors. And those two plays are actually the only ones that, that adhere to, in some way, to the neoclassical unities of space, time, and action. Uh, in The Tempest, we see everything happening within more or less three hours, uh, more or less one place, this, this island, and more or less one plot. And, of course, describing that might be a little difficult, but something like revenge or something like preparing for the future uh, of Prospero and his daughter. Um, this island is a thing for us to consider. Where is it? Um, it clearly is the case that Shakespeare is drawing off of uh, contemporary explorers' accounts of the New World. But when that term shows up in the play, Oh Brave New World, uh, he's not he's not first referencing uh, the voyages of exploration and that's that's something we have to think very 
very intently about. Um, he's trying to revitalize the old, and, and we can ask ourselves how successful he might be in the avenues that he's uh, going down here. The island is uh, explicitly located somewhere in the Mediterranean, but it is, it's very liminal. It's, on, it's in between heaven and earth and politics and the monastery and um, history and eternity. It's in between. And that's a question as to why, why this setting? What's going on here? Who's being changed? Uh, we see a lot of structural doublets as far as um, what has happened to Prospero before the play begins and is related by Prospero to his daughter at the beginning of the play. But we also see that re, uh, being replayed for us in the conspiracies that um, go forward as the drama unfolds. The island seems to be something like what um, the theologian Origen called a, a moral gymnasium, that the world is, um, is here to exercise us for um, uh, morally and to make us the, the persons we are meant to be. There's something about that. Is it, a, as I ask in the questions, um, is this a good or bad place, right? The father-daughter drama is very, very salient here. And of course, that, that does have something to do with his biography. And it also, critics will tend to, to take that, um, it for granted that there is something about Shakespeare's biography in, in the meditations on uh, the power of art here. And I, I do think that that's, that's a legitimate thing um, to follow through. Uh, the, the structure of this play is very perspicuous, certainly compared to others there's, uh, of his plays. It's, it's, it's a play that you could hope to somehow get into one um, glance. So that's, that's a very exciting thing. And, and then hopefully we can go from here and read others of his plays with um, an increased ability to absorb more of what he's doing, to see more. Um, in the other romances, that preceded this, they, they aren't, they, they are very sprawling. They, so what is it that makes these last plays different? Well, there's something about the scope. That they're huge, certainly, in uh, Cymbeline and Winter's Tale as far as history and, and, and geography. But even though The Tempest contracts everything down, I think it still is big thematically as, as any play that Shakespeare wrote. So that's, that's another thing to keep in mind. Is this, a, is this a domestic drama or is it something really world historical? Uh, I wanted to point out a few things about the uh, technical uh, nature of the poetry. Uh, as some of you know, most of Shakespeare's plays are in uh, uh, blank verse, which is iambic pentameter that is not rhymed. And I've got a few, a couple of lines here just to indicate what that looks like. So this is from Caliban's um, very moving speech about the music of the island. So, be not a bump of feared, be not a feared, the aisle is full of noises. So that you've got a bump, a bump, that's I, and I am is short, um, uh, uh, unstressed, stressed. Be not a feared, the aisle is full of noises. And that last, that's an extra syllable, it's a so called a feminine um, ending sounds and sweet airs that give delight and hurt not. So you've got bump, 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 five times. That's the iambic pentameter. Uh, in the plays, you don't just have blank verse, though. You also have prose at about a quarter of the time. And the prose is often reserved for the lower class speakers. Now, it's very significant that this speech of Caliban's is in poetry. Um, so. Noting that is, is also very helpful. Um, I'll wrap up here. There is this, there, some of the speeches of, of Prospero are, are especially important. And there's the one where uh, when he's presenting as kind of a, uh, an engagement gift to his daughter and Ferdinand, uh, this mask, a, a play, a dumb, oh, um, not a dumb show, a, 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 a a, um, a play within a play, as in fact this would be for the nuptial celebrations of King James's daughter. And he suddenly remembers, oh, Caliban is going to try to kill me. And uh, he, he makes the, um, the spirits go away quickly. 
and um, Ferdinand and Miranda are startled. And Prospero gives this, this great speech, and I'll, I'll end with this. You do look, my son, in a moved sort, as if you were dismayed. Be cheerful, sir. Our revels now are ended. These are actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherit shall dissolve. And like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Sir, I am vexed. Um, these themes are very dear to Shakespeare, and uh, we, I, I, it is very pleasing, and it is very pleasurable for us to try to get our own lives in view in light of um, the fact that he's pointing to, that Prosper is pointing to here. There's something um, somewhat dreamlike in, in our lives. The question is, what rounds us? Is it, some, is it simply a, uh, a sleep? Is there a providence? Is there, um, is there nothing? Uh, it, it's it's, it's as, as, as uh, important a question for us to ask in our own lives and figuring out how we should live our lives as, as any. Um, so as far as the questions that I've suggested for our conversation, which I think really are helpful in, in, in packing this. So number one, is divine providence dramatized in the tempest? Or are we presented with a nihilistic world horizon by secular power, art, magic, conspiracy, and the vanity of that power? Number two, is Prospero's Island a desert or a paradise? What qualities make it suitable to be a place for personal transformation and reconciliation? Can marriage and political life successfully follow upon the island's utopian magic? Number three, is the slavery of Caliban and Ariel justifiable? Does the play present authority as simply a matter of power? And number four, does humor humanize or degrade the characters who make us laugh? What dramatic effect does music have in this play? I, with Prospero, all of us, male and female, uh, white, non-white, or is that social positioning um, something that keeps us from feeling the force of this play as a play about, sometimes at least, what it means to just be human?